Uh, let's see. Chris added you if you're on my Instagram live, and there he is. See that? At our age, we figured it out. It took me a minute. I've only done one. Have I done one of these? Yeah, I did one of these. Well, on your second try, considering it's only 1103, you did pretty good. There are others that took him at least to 1104. So, you know, you're killing it. How are you, my friend? Nice to see you here in the quarantine days of semi quarantine. I'm okay. I'm okay. I mean, you know, can't. We all have, like, uh, we all share one problem. It's like Corona's like this house guest that won't leave. Yeah. Like, yeah. When are you leaving? <laughs> We've always had problems where there's an end in sight, in theory, right? Like, even a great fire in California where it's like, eventually it's going to go out. Eventually. It, event, yes. It's just a question of when at this point. And I was talking to some people earlier. And it was like, you know, that one thing that humans really hate the most is uncertainty. And I think that our entire society right now, globally, is really just so uncertain that that's really what's giving a lot of anxiety. Not just the death part, but just we don't know what tomorrow is going to be. I mean, it's like any bad situation. It's like uh, you have to accept it. And once you accept it, you know, it's like guys going to jail. It's like... Once you make accept, peace. yeah. Once you accept your bid, then your bid will go by faster. Right. But if I you're started, fighting it, like I, don't, I shouldn't be here. Well, yeah, you're gonna be there for life. Right. Sometimes so, when it's a life sentence, I wonder if it's easier than like that three-year sentence, kind of like the three-hour plane ride versus the ten-hour plane ride. Like on the second hour, you're going nuts, but on a ten-hour, you could just kind of chill till the eighth hour, ninth hour. Yeah, but you gotta accept it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. we have. If we accept that this is how it's going to be till at least Valentine's Day. Right. Like, really, like, it's yeah, not at least. at least Valentine's Day. It's crazy how human beings think that a virus is on their time. Right? Yeah, it's, like, it's not on your are time. Are we that ignorant? <laughs> it's going to get worse. Uh, you can't be too careful. Uh, yeah, it's. What if you? You're in New York, right? I'm in New York. Or, yeah. or New York, New Jersey. Yeah. So, so I'm in California, but I'm a New Yorker. But I moved out here, and I was like kissing the ground over the last six months, which I never really thought I would be so happy to be out of New York City as I am in the last you know few months because we have space here, and there's outdoors, and there's warm yeah. weather. How's it been in New York for you? I mean, I'm in, I'm in Jersey. I'm like right outside so, the city. So you're in the burbs. So you got you got some got, space. I got room, and you know, I got. I don't want to yeah. get ostentatious at right. a time where people are uh, suffering. But I I I got plenty room. Yeah. Uh, and I actually I was in LA a couple of weeks ago. So. So you're traveling a bit. I mean, a little bit. I'm, but I I've accepted that this thing is going to be here till at least. You know, yeah. Well, that's Valentine's the point. Day, at least so. who knows? And if you, yeah, by the way, so, I, would, I, mean, I would take you know, Valentine's Day today as a deal. Yeah, yeah literally, I was looking crazy. at houses in L.A. Just like, okay, maybe I'm gonna spend the winter. Yeah. Like a, you know, because Corona in the winter, quarantine in the winter is like yeah. a whole other thing. It is. So. Yeah, and we caught it. You know, towards the end of March, it was still freezing in New York, and I was just like, man, thank God I got out here. Yeah. Because it was just, you know, it was hard enough here with two kids and, you know, just being outside. And, yes, we have some space. But, like, imagining doing that inside, indoors, whether you're just indoors yeah. in New Jersey or indoors in the apartment in New York, is hell on earth. But not to be too morbid about it because, you know, we're all living the same reality, which is just the unknown. And, and it is what it is. Yeah. But, and, and people are, you know, there's people are, you know, people are losing jobs. People are, people's lives are in pause. You know, and people are. You know, people are yes. making real decisions, man. Yes. People are deciding between medicine and food right now. Yeah, yeah you it's know? horrible. And for whatever reason, our government, like France, they just forgave. They just basically said no rent, no mortgage, everybody. They just like forgave everything. Like, for the I don't whole know. time. But, I don't know what the the solution is because it's so vast and it's so big and everything affects something else. You know, you can look down to like the lowest on the totem pole to the highest on the totem pole. We are all connected no matter how you look at it. I was talking to someone yeah. in real estate yesterday and he's like, yeah, I get it. People are out of work. 
customers aren't coming to your business, you're closed down, and then therefore you don't want to pay our rent. But if you don't pay our rent, we can't pay our banks. And then the banks can't pay the dividends on people who invested. Yeah. And then those things are in pension plans all over the world. Yeah. And it's like, where do you start forgiving? You just pause for a few months. Wouldn't that be nice? But I don't know. You know, I don't know what a France, country of our France size you could do. France stopped everything. France forgave the landlords, which meant the landlords could forgive the tenants, which like... For forgave the banks and yeah, like, and so forth. For the left. I mean, so it has been done. We just... America, but, but is food free there? No, but right? food is like, kind of free when you don't have to pay rent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? use, use the same you don't have you to, When you don't have to pay a mortgage, yes. Yes, food is a lot easier to obtain. I'm curious to see what happens when the unemployment runs out, if it does, in the end of July here, because I think we're really living off of a boosted economy from awarded yeah. benefits, obviously, and it's a little scary to see what's going to happen. Well, you know, I mean, I don't want to get on a Trump rant. Yeah, I try not to. But... <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not. But and he's got a lot of faults, but the dumbest thing America did was we made a landlord the president. Yeah. That's landlords. one of our dumbest things. Like, like a landlord. Got a laundry don't list. Give a fuck. I got a list of stupidity here. From yeah, America. a landlord like, wow. wants his money. When a woman and her two children go, hey, we can't pay the rent, the landlord goes, hey, let me get some boxes. Like, right. that's what You're a nice tomorrow. landlord does. Right. So, we, we, you know, we got a landlord running the country. So, <laughs> yeah, landlords. A landlord want slash reality money. president. Reality slash. Yeah. So, Landlords know, like, want their money. So, aim. hey, this is, you know, this is where we're at. It's, it's, it's uh, frustrating, but. My f I'm good. My family's good. Uh, you know, it's, it's like things I'm ashamed of. I used to complain all the time about having to take care of my family, like being that guy. Yeah. And now in this time, I, I'm like, I literally get on my knees every day and thank God I can take care of my family. Yeah. You know, like cousins. The most basic and thing that you cousins can Cousins and, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like, you know, I got a lot of, I can like take care of my family. I can help out my friends. I can, you know, you know, like my bubble. I can like basically yeah. help everybody ride this out. Yeah. And I used to really complain about it. It was like, oh, everybody comes to me. Now I'm like, you know what? God did this to you for a reason. Yeah. And uh, God yeah. gave you the gift that now you can really give back yeah. and take care of people. Yeah. So, it's the most basic necessity at this point. We're like, I used to think of all the things in the beginning, like, oh, we can't travel. We can't do this. We can't do that. And meanwhile, I'm like, thank God we have a home. Thank God yeah, we're able man. to eat. Thank God we're healthy. Got a home and then everything and else seems to be a lot more simple. I got room and, you know, this brother's at, the, you know, whatever, man. This is, we got it easy, man. But it's a lot of people got it really hard right now and really have some big decisions to make in the yeah. next few months. And the only way really to overcome it is as a society. You know, it's not one thing the government can only do. It's not one thing that you yourself can't, you can't save the world personally. But I think as an entire society, we really need to look yeah, at how it's like, we have to come together and be That's helpful. the saddest thing about this whole, um, the whole pandemic. It's like, uh, it didn't, I mean, right now, every, you know, LA's on fire. Arizona's on fire. Florida, Texas. And it didn't have to get this bad. But, you know, I thought we lived in one country. But <laughs> evidently, we live in 50 different countries. Yeah. And if, you know, the powers that be decided to act as one, we could literally be, we could have been out of this thing by now. We could have yeah. literally been living kind of normal lives. But... You know, we're a team. And yes, if you would have if you would have instituted laws or you know, rules for the whole country at the same time, yes, it would have affected some states unfairly. Yeah. But that's what happens in a team. Yeah. Sometimes Michael Jordan gets more shots. Yeah. Than John and some Hattie, are on the like, bench like, until they're needed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Horace Grant has to set picks. Like sometimes things have to be uneven. Yeah for the team to win. It's a very good analogy. 
America was, for whatever reason, Trump did not view it as a team. You know, people are gonna die. Yeah. Lots and you look at like Texas and Florida. Die. Yeah, we're not. Like, not even die, man. Just like I got relatives I talk to. You know, that are just in that the coronavirus is just terrorizing them. Yeah. Because they're like in a building, and then somebody on the floor over them died, and somebody under them died, and they hear ambulances and, yeah. and sirens going by. Like people are like really being like traumatized by this. But yeah, man. No, it's it's, 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 it's sad. It's really it's sad. A, it's it's unfortunate that it's taking hindsight to maybe get this out of. Oh, now Florida, now Texas, yeah, now the states, like, even Arizona, who was like nothing. They, they, the arrogance of human beings, and I agree with the lack of leadership as being as one. The team is the perfect example. It's like, team. okay, so you couldn't just sit on the bench. You had to, you had Somebody's to like, get yourself in the there. Somebody's got to sacrifice shots. Somebody now has we lose. to not, like, we just, yeah, that's how teams win. And yeah, the but goal you know what? Is the team win. wins with a good coach. And, you know, yeah. people always talk about the big star of the team. No, it's really coming down to leadership. It's, yeah, it's, it's management. And, yeah. Bad management you know, here. It's horrible mess. So we got, it's, it's, you know, we got 50 countries, not 50 states, 50 countries. Do you think, because now when you look at that map and it's completely red with, you know, rising cases and all that stuff, that do you think now we have a way out as a result of just we had to go all the way to the bottom of hell, essentially? To I don't know. I mean, what? the only, dude, it's still, you still have to play as a team. It's still... You know, it, I don't. You know, I don't. You know, there's n there's never a way out until everybody sits down and gets on the same page. Yeah. You know, you yeah, can lose 100%. forever. You, like, the whole like the whole analogy. You know, like in sports, all it can't get any worse. It can always get worse. Yeah. I Life hope it can, doesn't, but I know I it can. I hope it doesn't. I agree. It, but it can always get worse. That's it the can sick part. Always, <laughs> you know. Well, we've been, yeah, it can always get worse. Let's yeah. hope it doesn't. Let's hope it doesn't, you know, let's be positive. So. All right, thinking positive. positive. I want to switch gears for a second because let's switch gears. not only, um, it's been very know, therapeutic. My, I just came from yeah. my, my shrink. Oh, so no. I'm very shrinked you up. You could lay back on the couch if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make I you just, feel I like, just, you know, you're I having did, a matter of fact, I did two shrinks and then you. So I'm are you very, doing the video conference? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I do. I, I did a shrink in a group, and now you. So all right. This is, so let me take it back to childhood, Chris. Let me take it back to childhood. Yes, I'm not even kidding, actually. I really. You have to. Because, you have to. It's because, all about. It's all about childhood. Your whole life is, is about childhood. It is. It, 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 and the experience you've had as a young child, different from other people, how it affected you, where it influenced you, and all that stuff. I've always been curious, and the reason I like doing this is because. A, I'm an admirer from afar. Of course, I'm, I'm fortunate you. that I've gotten to meet you in person many times and even sit and have dinner with you on a few occasions. Hey, and you I, have, and you I have cherish one of the them. nicest restaurants in New York I and L.A. It. But New I York, that, that, you know, outside that patio, I've, I've celebrated some momentous occasions there. Having so. your crab, I know. You yeah. love the crab. Having my soft shell crab. Soft shell's yes. back in season coming up. Soft shell's crab. I, I have my... my I was getting ready to say something. I was getting ready to sound like a rich guy. My housekeeper just made me some sauce. <laughs> uh, All right. You know what? To be a rich guy and being taken care of people is not a bad thing. It's just like, you know, it's what you do with it. And I think you've been amazing. Um, um, but what? it's what got you to be a rich guy. And and rich doesn't I mean, necessarily mean not, money. Rich, I'm not, rich talking, is not, not talking money. I always say rich is not about money. Rich is about options. Rich is about options. But when do I you have you, options it, in life? If you can only do one thing... That's very, you know, it, it doesn't feel free. Yeah. So rich is about options. Well, you've created your options. Nothing was handed to you. Nothing was said, oh, you're just blessed. And here you go. Enjoy uh, stardom well, and being the best. I, I've had help. Got. I'm not going to sit here and like nobody helped me. And So who helped you? you I know, know Eddie Murphy all. discovered you, right? Yeah, I mean, the Eddie so Murphy's what, of the help? world, the... Uh, the Laura Michaels of the world, but then you know, then it's like a guy, this guy named. There's like the unsung heroes. A guy named Nelson George, the writer, kind of like taught me how to write, mm -hmm. and exposed me to like you know good films and stuff. Like a friend of mine, Lewis Hamilton, like exposed me to like 
you know, like quirky, weird, you know, ex exposed me to Kubrick, you know, mm -hmm. and when I was like a kid in bed -Stuy, I'm watching Dr. Strangelove and, mm -hmm. and weird Woody Allen movies and stuff. So there's like, yeah, there's the obvious people. And then, you know, there's the other, you know, there was a, there was a waitress that used to work at the, at the comic strip uh, named Francesca that just told me how arrogant I was one night. <laughs> it was like, you know, and like, I try not to be arrogant. I try like to yeah. work on in, you know, work on this ego thing, you know. There's, you know, there's lots of people, lots and lots and lots and lots. It's got Andre Harrell, who just passed. Rest in peace, yep. Uh, you know, Keenan Waynes was like a great mentor guy, always, you know, give you five minutes and answer your questions. Yeah. Damon Wayans, mm -hmm. by the way, taught me literally everything I know about being a stand-up. You know, lots, lots of people. You know, you, you talk about arrogance, and I found that arrogance, which I also have been accused of being uh, throughout my career in life, um, which I've tried to overcome, but there's something about arrogance that gets you on that stage in the beginning. There's something about it's arrogance that gets arrogance, you out there. But you got, it's like a dance you got to walk, man. Because if you're too arrogant, if you're too bitter, if you're too caught up in yourself, people don't want to help you. Yeah. People don't want to reach out to you. People don't want to, don't want you around. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? People don't want you around for experiments. Yeah. Like you got to like really, you know, I mean, there's a few assholes in show business, but not uh, the really successful people, not as many as you would think. They're it's funny, really, like Chevy Chase has always been referred to as the biggest yes, asshole in show business, you know, but he's but, a, you know, he's an exception. He's so great. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like most like really successful people that I've met are, first of all, they oh. know exactly who they are. <laughs> they're very you know uh just genuine and you know giving and so, you got to give to get i you, agree and and it's great advice for everybody who like starts out and you know younger the people are generally and the more talented they are the more arrogant seems to come with it because they think the best at something meanwhile they're still only 16 17 18 years old they don't know shit yet and yeah. and at what what age though in your life it's a lot did of talent you feel out like, there. Yeah. Did you know you were talented though at a, at a young age in a way that other people weren't in the world of either comedy yeah. or storytelling yes, or writing? One second, one second. My daughter's calling. No worries. Yes. How it is? Okay. I love you too. Okay. It's my 18-year-old daughter who's going to college. Going to college, in, going to college in Paris. In September, so I'm, I'm gonna wow. only have one. Which, kid is it uni is it the American University of Paris? Yes, or what, the American University of Paris. So okay, I'm nice. gonna I'm gonna be down to one kid. Uh, yes. How old's your younger? Sixteen. So 16. I got, right, so you I got, got about a years. year and a half, and then I can pretty much live Start anywhere over. I want to live, <laughs> go anywhere I want to go. Yeah. Anyway, we were, you, what you, were we talking yeah. about? Well, we were so talking about like, when. When did you know? that you had something unique or just a love or passion for something. You know, I mean, like... I knew I wanted to be a comedian when I was like seven, eight years old. Uh, because... I, it just, it just interests me. I just like, you know, back then, you know, there was a lot of variety shows on television and you, you'd see like a singer and you'd see dancers and jugglers and comedians and just comedians to me were just more interesting then, you know, Flip Wilson was more interesting to me than Gladys Knight. Like I could see people mm -hmm. sing in church, but this comedy thing's like, wow, how, did, how do you even do that? And it just brought me so much joy. So I- I agree, yeah. I, I was obsessed with comedy growing up my whole life and which is why I'm such a big fan of yours and, and I can go all the way back to the yeah, beginning. It's like, you know, it's, it's but, like verbal magic. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> to make people laugh, like you can watch it and you can study it and you still like, how do you do that? How do mm -hmm. you know, I, I was what in I, well, What I felt that you've always, what you've done so well in such a, like an incredible way is that, you know, you've taken comedy, which obviously most comics or a lot of comics do have a really creative way of turning a mirror on ourselves and pointing out the obvious things that we do on a daily basis that we don't necessarily articulate in a comedic way. But you've done it in such like a laser sharp way, whether it's 
the problems of the times or politics and you've always sort of gravitated towards the hardships and the 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 bad things of our society which are really relevant today obviously but have been relevant forever to you when did you become so like focused on that genre or do you think it just kind of morphed with age or was it from your childhood and growing I mean, up or what i mean it's weird when you're a comedian or you're a writer or what you know anybody that puts pen to paper it's like your first job is not even being funny. Your first job is to just notice everything. Mm. So your mind is almost like a surveillance camera. It's like, even though you're not zeroing in on anything, you pick up everything. You know what mm. I mean? Like everything ends up in your head. And yeah, I just realized like, I was good with patterns. I was good with seeing like, ooh, this person did this and this person did this three weeks ago. And then five people, before I know it, I realized five people had said something or acted a certain way. I was like, oh, I can make a joke about that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like finding like the patterns in human behavior. And yeah. If you but can that's do an that, art form. And then, and to do that, to make it where it's actually funny to other people, not just to you. Is yeah, once you, I mean, once and it's you realize itself. what you're talking about is universal, mm -hmm. you're like, okay, it'll probably work. It'll probably yeah. get a, a laugh, you know? I love when you talk about liars. You're a liar. Liars. You're a liar. You're a liar. You're not, you're not real. That's not your uh, hair. That's not your fingernail. That's my favorite. Oh, that one. I don't There's so many favorites of mine of yours, like, you know, but, but the, the comedic, the, the comedian of itself, forever has been politically incorrect and that's where you can get away with it because it's in the kind of wrapping of comedy today however it seems like that is a even bigger challenge than ever before what you can and can't say now even in comedy does that make your life more difficult or does it inspire you to push the envelope more uh you know a lot of good arts made during censorship you know what i mean it's like I don't know. I'm, has it affect Dave? Not really. You know, it's, I don't know. I don't think about the censorship that much. I mean, yeah, people I mean, get, you hosted the Oscars, like big things like that. Like, you know, to be able to do that or not be able to do that now because of things of the past coming back and haunting, it's kind of a scary time for comedy, I felt like. It was like disappointing to me to see all those kind of reactions to comedy specifically. I mean... If it's funny, it's undeniable. It cuts through all of that stuff. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't know. I don't really worry about the censorship. I, I, I mean, ooh, did, I, did I just go habada habada? <laughs> I wish, it's weird. Because a lot of the censorship is coming from people that don't respect comedy to, be, to begin with. Because if you really respected comedy, you would realize the audience is always right. And... I've never seen a comedian continue to do a joke that doesn't get a laugh. Sure. Like, like you don't have to tweet me. You don't have to DM me to tell me something's not funny. I'm listening. Yeah, I just <laughs> felt like the, the dangerous to today laugh, is that you're... I don't ever yeah, you know. want to do it again. But nowadays with social media and the way things go like wildfire, fire, you work on one joke in one place. It could be in like to 10 people and it can go worldwide and offend all these people. And, then, and next thing you know, you're yeah. apologizing on the news the next day. It's just a great to me. It's just an, an, a, it's, it's a sad part of the times. I mean, I, you I, know, I guess it's it. a younger guy's problem. It's like. The way I look at it is like I have a relationship with the audience. Mm hmm. And the audience, and me and the audience, we've literally been dating for 30 years. Yeah. And we have a shorthand and the audience knows, the audience knows what I mean. The audience mm -hmm. knows how I feel. And I'm not really, as long as I'm true and honest with the audience, mm -hmm. I'll be fine. You know, Agreed. worrying All right, well, about, that's a good point of view. Yeah, I mean... The surest As way opposed to, to walking up, on eggshells. Yeah, it's just like the sure. I mean, you're 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 married. It's like surest way to mess up your marriage is worrying about what people outside of your house think. Right. You know what I mean? Totally. And that's how I feel about my relationship with the audience. It's like 
I have a relationship with them. Like, boo, you, you know how, you know. What's, what's that old John B. song? Uh, they don't know about you and me. <laughs> they don't know about this here. Like, yeah. So I got a relationship with the audience. Bill Burr has a relationship with the audience. Dave yeah. Chappelle has a relationship with the audience. And yeah, if you're not in that relationship, yeah, you might see something out of context and get offended. You know? Yeah, but totally. Remember, no, I mean, I'm, 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 like, me and me and my audience, we're we're good with this. I'm, I've been there for the 30 years, so I agree with that 100%. Yeah. And speaking of 30 years ago, did you know New, York, New Jack City and that pookie roll would be such a big deal or no? You know what's wild? I had no idea. I remember, uh, I remember, I said member. It's weird. We were, we rehearsed for like a week or almost two weeks. It was just me, Ice-T, Alan Payne, maybe Chris Williams was there, uh, Vanessa Williams. It was like a bunch of us. We were in rehearsal like, whatever, two weeks without Wesley. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen Wesley. I didn't see, I didn't see the major league movie. I'd never like, I kind of knew him for the Michael Jackson bad video. Right. So I didn't know if he could act or not. Willie Mays Hayes. Great. Right. So <laughs> we're doing rehearsal and then Wesley comes in and sits at the head of the table. Now, while we're doing rehearsal without him, we're like, not that we thought the movie was bad, but we just thought it was a job. Mm -hmm. We just thought it was a job and okay, we'll be done with this. And, you know, I was getting scaled. I was like, okay, maybe I can get a down payment on a Corvette or whatever. You know, it was literally like right. 88 or 89, right? Yeah. Wesley comes in, sits at the head of the table and starts reading Nino Brown. And me and Ice-T like looked at each other and me and Al, we're like, oh, shit. We about to be in a motherfucking classic. Mm -hmm. Like this guy is amazing. Like yeah. it was like Marlon Brando sat down. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he started, it took us. Everybody realized they, how good they had to be. Like when when Nino sat down. Yeah. Yo, it was yeah. Talk about so, the greatest names in the movie: Nino Brown, G Money, Nino Brown, Pookie. So, Yo, I, I, it's not that I knew it was going to be a, cl a classic, but I knew, I knew it, we were going to be heard. Yeah. And yeah. it's weird. It's, it's 30 years later. It's the biggest movie I've ever been in. It is, and I'm sure still, that's the one people that people still call talk me Pookie. to. Pookie. Yeah. Yeah. I get, I get yeah. called Pookie all the time. Guys used to like it's bring me right. crack. They used to try to like <laughs> give me crack. I'd be at a club and like, yeah. like yeah. real like, drug dealers are like, dick. <laughs> hey, take some of this. I got something for you. And be like, crack. In my yeah, unbelievable. Like, okay. The night's that was such a, great. Did you feel like that movie was a pivotal point in your career or it just like kind of developed over the years and time? Or was Saturday Night Live something more like special? And then hindsight, you look back and you're like, those two years or three years, whatever, was incredible. And then you got fired or left, whatever the hell the story is. It, you know, like, was that the New, blessing New in disguise you needed? Thing. It's like... I didn't, I wasn't sophisticated enough to know how, I didn't, I wasn't sophisticated enough to know how good it could be for my career. Yeah. Okay. I was really about partying. I was really about drugs. I was really about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like I knew I was famous after New Jack. Like, I don't think I took the subway for like, 20 years after New Jack. Right. You made it. Yeah. Like, like, <laughs> ooh, I can get into any club. Right. Pretty much anywhere in the world. Like, I, that was like my concern. So I didn't, I, it's, it's weird. It's a lot of my career. I could have, if I was sophisticated, <laughs> I could have done a lot more with that part. I remember, here's a weird one. Uh, right after New Jack, Julian Schnabel, you know Julian Schnabel. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, the he artist. wanted. Got a I great think he wanted me to play. I think he wanted me to play Basquiat. Like it was talk of me playing Basquiat. All right. You ever seen that, that movie great. with Jeffrey Wright? Yeah. I mean, Jeffrey Wright's amazing, yeah. and he's yeah. much better actor than me. But I was again. I didn't have the sophistication. I didn't even know who Basquiat was then. 
You know what I mean? Like I didn't, I didn't yeah. know who Schnabel was. I didn't know who Basquiat was. I was like, I was really from Bed Stuy. I was really like this. You know, I was yeah. I was just a crackless pookie. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I get it. But you grew up in Bed Stuy in the height of the rise of hip hop, which that in I itself up, is like an incredible time to be alive. In rise that, of hip hop. Rise of crack. I saw crack. I saw hip hop. I used to hang at the Albi Square Mall with a Big Daddy Kane and <laughs> and Bismarck and you know, yeah. like Did you, you open for Run like, DMC or something? Huh? Back in the day, did you have something to do? Were you on tour with I Run DMC? I wasn't on tour Run DMC. It was weird. I was supposed to tour Run DMC, and at the last minute, either Russell Simmons or Lear Cohen like kicked me off the tour. Like I was, I never even made it. Right? They yeah. hired this other guy. His name was uh, Chris Thomas. He used to do a lot of impressions. He was really good out right. of DC. And uh, I ended up doing the Heavy D tour. I ended up Heavy spending D. the summer. Another rest in peace. I loved Heavy Another rest in peace. Personally. Andre Greatest Harrell guy. liked me and said, asked me if I wanted to open up for Heavy D. So I spent the summer touring with Heavy D and, and then I'll be sure. So you were one of the boys. Heavy yeah, D yeah. You, so you, I did Heavy D, I'll be sure, Keith Sweat, and uh, I yeah. did Terrence Trent Darby. I spent like basically two years on the road with like, you know, not rock stars, but R and B stars and yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, it shaped it shaped. And then a I lot assume you got to you got to meet a lot of, lot of those. Yeah, for sure. I mean the the Russell Simmons, the Andre Harrell's the Puff early on. Yeah, then I mean, Biggie I mean, yeah, comes Puff, in. It was it was like literally Puff would be at me, Puff, Mary, we'd be like in Brooklyn, like outside of Andre Harrell's office, like waiting for him to like throw crumbs our way. Like Yeah. Like, hey it's incredible. Yeah. Did you get to meet Biggie or no? Yeah, I used to see Biggie all the time. Biggie used to live I used to see Biggie, he used to, there's a McDonald's on um, Fulton and, you know, like Fulton and Flatbush, mm -hmm. Fulton and Flatbush. I see, I see Biggie there every day. Every single day, Biggie would get there, <laughs> he, he'd be sitting shotgun, Lil C's would be driving. So yeah, I, I met Biggie a bunch of times. Or they would eat at Mike's. There's a place on DeKalb Avenue that they would come by for breakfast, and mm -hmm. Biggie would get, you know, fish, I mean, grits and salmon or whatever. I yeah. I, I was I so was, sad I, when people of that talent die at a young age. It's like you know, I think like now how wonderful it is. I get to like sit and hear Nas at a dinner table talk, or or Snoop or Dr. Dre, and these guys are walking around. It's like. Biggie, Tupac, the, the, yeah. the fact that they're not around is like such a it's such I've a had a very uh, Forrest Gumpish life. I've kind of met everybody. Some of it makes no sense. I mean, like, I know you were at the White House. A bunch like of yesterday, times I Obama's actually, birthdays, this right? is, I'm brag. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say why I talked to these people, but yesterday I I, I talked to Biden and Kanye at different. <laughs> like, like that's my life. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, you're, yes, you're, you're in that house. world. So how were those White House? I mean, I heard because Cassidy, who's actually going to come on after this for a second, who, who DJed those parties, you know, said it was just mind blowingly cool. I was to at, be at the White House. Yeah, was I was at like? the last White House party. It was great. It was incredible. It was like you died and went to black heaven. Like everybody was there. It wasn't even just everybody. I remember that night. I actually I had, a, I had my longest conversation with David Letterman that night. <laughs> like, uh, but the sad thing is I remember was while we were leaving the party, you could see the, uh, the Raptors going up, the seats for the inauguration. And you're like, oh, right. this is really over. over. And this, yeah. this shit's really about to change. And, yeah. Yeah. and it sure as hell did. More right. So it was great while it lasted. Yeah, it was Christ. good while it lasted. What's on your back wall there? Are those cassettes or DVDs? No, or... those are books. Oh, those are books. I, I don't really read that much. Clearly, I don't recognize them. Those are, that's a book. Yeah, books and TV. Yeah, this is my... Are you a big reader? 
I am a. I know big, you're a big writer. I'm a big reader. It's weird. You know, it's weird. I got. I'm, I'm listening to a lot of books on tape now. I got. I got diagnosed with a learning disorder that I've. I guess I've had my whole life. And I've always had a hard time reading. I've almost always had to like read books three times. Same. You ever get, get to the them. bottom of the next page and you're turning it so you know you read it, but you have no idea why you're turning it? And then yes. So over again. lately, ADD, baby. in January, I got diagnosed. Like I went to this doctor and whatever. And they did like this whole uh, cognitive test on me. And mm. I got diagnosed with this learning disorder. And but one of the things the doctor told me is like, you should, you should listen to your books from now on. That's all I do. So and, it, and it's great because I can watch... And hear and read, or hear and comprehend versus reading it, it's virtually impossible. Yeah, so I kind of yeah, listen I like and I keep a pen and I like listen and I write, write notes. So I don't really. What are you listening? What are you listening to now? That's great. Anything? Uh, anything top of mind? I'm, oh man, I'm listening to like this this book about childhood trauma called the uh, The Body Keeps Score. It's really deep. It's really deep. I'm listening to that right now. Then, when you're uh, done, try uh, algebra. The algebra of happiness. The really algebra good. of happiness. I will check that yeah. out. The, yeah, yo, that Scott body Calloway keeps score is, is like some deep. If you have any, yeah. I'm gonna write it down. The body it's keeps a, score. It's a good one, and it'll. Some of it you'll it'll apply to you, and some of it you'll be like, oh, okay, that's why that person is that way. It'll it'll give you compassion, for the people that have done you wrong. Got it. And it'll help you forgive deal your with enemies, it. but don't forget their names. Yeah, it'll My it'll give quote. you compassion. <laughs> it'll definitely like make you think of things in a different light. You you'll it'll make you awesome. far less judgmental. Okay, I'm gonna do it. And yeah. next time I see you, we'll discuss it. What's your favorite movie? You got one? This is my favorite movie. It changes all the time. You know what my favorite movie yeah, is like right now? Is The mm. Social Network. You like I the kinda, journey story? Huh? You like the story of a journey of how things actually become? You know what? You know what I like about it? I'm, I'm trying to move because I guess this guy's cutting my grass or something. That's right. But um, what I like about it is it's like they're both right. You know, like. Um, you're talking Mark about the Winkle Vi? Right. Or you're talking Zuckerberg? Mark Zuckerberg's absolutely right about not expanding the business and not taking ads. And what you call it? The other guy's right. And sometimes talking both, about uh, the Justin Timberlake character, Sean uh, Parker. Justin, they're all right. Justin Timberlake's right. Uh, what's the other kid? What's the kid? Uh, the CFO or the COO or whatever who's like yeah, yeah, raising yeah, yeah, yeah. money? Yeah, yeah, I forget his name, but yeah, true story. Yeah, they're all like, like, you know, what I mean, sometimes in life, it's not even about right or wrong. It's just about what level of right, you know. So is that the I, dope car collection I see in the back? Oh boy. You know, I have things. Um, <laughs> have, I have bike. Um, Are those electric? Do you, have, do you use the electric powered with bikes that, or no? You know, I'm scared of electric bikes because it's like, I'm fine. Great for hills. Yeah, it's just like I'm just finally in some decent shape. I actually have a, I don't have a six pack. I got like a four and a half. And That's great. it's like, uh, yeah, electric bike. Nah, man. It's like. No, but the beauty of the electric bike, and my partner Eugene uh, <laughs> uses it all the time now. He's moved to Connecticut for a while. But he's like, no, I bike the 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles. But when you're going up these brutal hills, it just gets you through it so you can continue on it. All right? no, like, I'm trying to stay in shape, man. I'm trying to, like. like... Well, you got, you got more shit coming up. Speaking of which, Fargo, my favorite show. Honestly, when people ask me during quarantine, what should I watch? I say, Star Wars Season 1 with Billy Bob, and then you'll be hooked. So you're in season four, is that correct? Oh yeah, we haven't finished filming yet. At Fargo. Or... Yeah. So it's been delayed because of obviously the situation, but. Most done, and then, you know, we got like two more episodes to go, but I go back, allegedly I start in, in August. And so you're I... playing, you're playing good guy, bad guy. I'm playing a bad guy. I just play this guy, Lloyd Cannon. And he's a gangster in 1950s, um, not Fargo, actually, in St. Louis. Am I, am I messing up? Literally, I've been, it's been a minute. Kansas City, that's it. We're from Kansas, Kansas City, right. That's where the gangsters from the other ones are. 
So, did you watch the original fir first three or first two? I, I mean, I watched it. I didn't have. I mean, it was my favorite show. So yeah, same. But um, it's weird. I just watched the first episode of the new season last night, and it's really good. <laughs> it's really good. The way they start those shows and those series are amazing. With the true story, and it's been changed. I mean, I guess a little bit of bullshit, but still, it's just the way they do those shows and the cinematography of all of them is really like on a whole nother level. It, it's kind of amazing. I hope we can get to finish it because you know, yeah. it's not playing. Have you watched Handsmaid's Tale? Hand Great, it's amazing. I, I love, love it. it. I yeah, just like did you watch the Mark Ruffalo thing. Uh, uh, with him as, like investigating dark water or something? No, 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 no. He just did this uh, HBO movie where he plays, it's him. He plays two parts. It's, it's, he, it's, he plays, it's basically he's twins and, and his twin brother's schizophrenic. And it's on HBO now. It's on HBO now. It's like, like, I always like watch him, it. but yo, he throws down. Wow. He, down it's so good speaking of hbo you got a lot of a lot of your career started with hbo i mean the show the the, the the chris rock show and obviously your comedy specials but would you ever do that again i love that show and you had grandmaster flash i mean talking about you know it's just like and you started so many people from that show that that were cameoed um i would you know i'm not against it i don't know what the these next two years, you know, ne not next two years. I got a year and a half. My daughter's out of school, right? Yeah. I'm planning on moving to L.A., and then we'll see. We will see. Well, I think it's a really, you know, to bring that type of a show back, maybe different format, I don't know, whatever, but you were so great at it. And you started, I think, like what, as a political commentator on Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher, right? Yes, I started on Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher. So, you know, Still going. Guy, Bill Maher, great guy, gave me my shot. G gave me my shot when I was done, mm -hmm. you know? That's so I always try to tell my friends, it's never too late to be good. <laughs> it's like, I know the last thing you did didn't work, and I know this didn't work, and I know failure, failure, failure. But it's like, if you're great, people will notice. And it's yeah. never too late. If you're in the well, game, that's... you can hit the winning shot. It's never too late. Yeah. And yeah, when I got that job, you know, I'd been fired from SNL and I'd been in movies that didn't work. And, you know, I was kind of a bust. It was like, it was like, oh, he's not Eddie Murphy. He's not Damon Wayans. He's not Martin. He's not, you know, and, you know, I don't know. The Lord, for lack of a better term, woke me up and I got <laughs> focused and, it really changed. That show really changed my whole life. Interesting. Well, I was a fan of that as well. And I watched it just yesterday. Um, and Bill comes in to catch a lot also. He's a good guy. Bill's a really good guy. Bill, Bill gave me a shot, and a lot of people would not have given me that shot. Now the noise you is are... can come back. Yeah, okay, good. Um, um, so what do you think you will be doing next, if you had to predict? I know it's impossible, but do you have some like dream that you haven't realized yet? No, nah, here's what's gonna happen. I mean, because of Corona, no one's touring for two years. Yeah. <laughs> Even if they are touring, like what I do, like no one's gonna be in, a, in, an, a, in an arena for two years. Yeah. I, it's highly unlikely, right? So, yeah, you got to rethink your whole life. So I'm going to probably direct. I'm going to probably direct. I'm going to probably direct soon. I'm almost done with this script. Because, honestly, there's nothing else for me to do. Like, like direct and star. But there's in, nothing In else a movie I'm that you wrote? Hmm? Oh, that's wrong. In a movie that you wrote? In a movie that I wrote, yeah. Yeah, that's what. You know. So writing, directing, and starring. Six hours of therapy a week helps you focus. So yes, I've finished the script and finished one script and almost finished with another script. And yeah, shit's, 
Yeah, because it's not, you're not, I can't tell jokes. There's no, you yeah. can't really have an audience. So, but, but it looks you, have like a, you have a Netflix deal for a second show? Yeah, so I owe them another special. And yeah, but you know, right now, you got to be live. For you got to be, you know, you got to have an audience. Yeah. So you don't want to see it without an audience. So I'm going to finish Fargo direct something, direct this movie I wrote, and yeah, let's keep it moving. Well, I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. And I appreciate your time. Hey, anytime. You've been very good to me. You've been very good to my family. I'm always treated well. It's at well, it's my it's honor to do that, to do that and to, to be able to speak to you today, and I appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you in person. When you come out to L.A., let me know so we can grab dinner. All right. Yeah, definitely. All right. Thank you, Chris. Be safe. Be healthy, my friend. All right. We go. I appreciate it. Good to see you. Woo! If you want another awesome video in our Black Excellence series, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there.